G'day everybody, Marty here from Orb Services. Today we're gonna to look at five things you absolutely must have in your business plan. Five very practical, clean, simple things that are gonna make an impact in your business and help you move forward and get the results that you want. If this is helpful to you, love for you to jump on any of our social channels, give us a follow uh, and subscribe to our newsletter if you think it's gonna be a win for you. Uh, look forward to bringing you new and exciting content each month. Again, all about just helping you move forward one piece at a time. So the first thing that we're gonna jump into and we're gonna talk about is setting a very clear destination. It's important to understand your why and your purpose and all that kind of stuff, it's exciting, but it's also sometimes a little bit fluffy and whimsical. What I wanna look at is three very simple things that you can put some very hard, practical, functional numbers around, and that way you can start to paint a bit of a picture about where you're going. Sometimes I call this a penthouse. As the business, as the end goal for your business, it's a penthouse, it's shiny and sparkly. What does it look like in a best case scenario for you? If you can picture this three, five, 10 years down the track, start to think about what I'm gonna talk about three, five, 10 years down the track. If you're in a position where you're thinking, holy shit, six months, 12 months is a long time away. Think as far forward as you can, and we're gonna talk about these three things. Financially, what is the bottom line that you need to draw out of the business? Basically thinking about in a wages and a business profit sense, how much money do you need to be taking out of your business? What does that work for? If you know clearly what you need to be making as a bottom line, then you can drive what happens on the top line. We start to look at what products that comes from, how the volume of those. So if you're a chiropractor or somebody in the allied health professions, for example, how many patients do you need to see? If you're a tradie with a team of staff, how many billable hours does that equal? If you're in the professional services, what's your product suite that's gonna make that up? So once you have a clear idea on this is how much financial, uh, what the financial requirements are, we can work backwards from there. The second piece is very important, time and role. What is the role that you wanna play in your business? Do you wanna be at a technician level, as a hands-on? Are you practicing still? Are you in a CEO setting the direction level? What is the number of staff that you're gonna to need to look after? What is the sort of size of your business and what is the role that you wanna play? If you want to have a really big number here and there's lots of zeros in this, then chances are this is gonna require a lot of time, a lot of drive, a lot of role for you. Every business is hard work. Every business has challenges. If you are thinking that you're gonna have a lot of commas in this section and pull in six hours a week or, you know, those type of things are very much unicorn senses. So, what is the role that you are gonna have and making sure that that time and role that you're committed to is gonna match your dollars and cents here. The last place, last thing that I look at is reach. Where are you going to sell your product or service? Could be a very small geographical area, could be a huge geographical area. Do people buy it in store, in a bricks and mortar store? Do people buy it online? How do I consume whatever the product is that you're trying to give me? Once you have this mapped out, we start to have a very clear idea of, let's take an example as a health professional. You know the dollar figure that you want to make and you know how many clients you need to see to do that you know that you wanna spend some time practicing and, and treating patients and you wanna spend some time running your business, which means you can work out that if you can see, if you need say 300 patients a week and you can see 100 patients a week, you need the capacity to be able to build 200 more patients through staff. So you've built that out and you know that you're gonna base it here in your local suburb and within a 10 kilometer radius of that, there's a million people and there's 15 different sporting clubs. So you should be able to bring in enough people from that. You've got a very clear practical idea of this is what's going on. Now, if this is a long way away, like it's a three, five year plan, it's a long way. If this is two times, three times, five times your current business size, what you wanna do is come back to where are you now? And then we want to build an interim goal somewhere here at about 12 months. 
So taking that example a little bit further, say you're trying to get 300 clients a week and you're currently at 150, that's double. Is it feasible to do that in the next 12 months? Now, I don't know the exact answer for that. It depends what your resources are that you've got to put behind it. If it is, great. If it's not, trim it back to what do you think is feasible in the next 12 months? What do you think would be feasible in the next three months, six months? Because the whole concept of a business plan is to help you get from here where you are now up to here, which is your end goal. But the way that we do that is not in one massive leap. We do that in little interim steps, interim steps, interim steps. So you wanna have this plan so that you can focus on what are the things that happen to get you from where you are now to a great position in the next 12 months. And then we break that down even further and go, okay, well, what happens in six months? What happens in the next one month? What happens in the next three weeks? And if you can start to break down your goals and what would be happening in those kind of levels, then these incremental improvements from here to here to here to here start to add up over time and really compound. If you don't have a very clear idea on what this looks like, way back here, you're gonna get distracted. You're gonna take one step this way and then over here and then down here and then back here and then up here and up here and down here. And this is what happens to people and why they never ever make it to here because if this is too far away, you can't actually focus on that. So you gotta break it down into same areas but what's tangible for you in the next week, month, six months, 12 months. Having that sort of clarity and that sort of knowledge around what you're doing in your business is gonna help you evaluate the tasks that you do and more importantly, the tasks that you don't do. So take five, pull some paper, write some of this stuff down and start to think about what can you do? What are the tangible targets that you can start to map in your business and how can you reach those in the next three, six, 12 months? and work backwards from there to look at the activity that you're doing and making sure that you're focused on what's most important for you right at this point in time. So the second part that we're gonna talk about is your customer base. Knowing who they are, making sure that you're providing a great service to them is a critical component to any business. Doesn't matter if you're a lawyer, a videographer, a chiropractor, a consultant, making sure that your customers are feeling value from you is the essence of what you're up to. I can't overemphasize the importance of this enough. You've got to have a focus on your customers all the time and making sure that you're providing value to them. A couple of ways that you can get some benefits here. I've drawn up here on the board, we've got three different types of customers. So there's a couple of different ways that you can do this. If you're a brand new business and you're not yet got an established customer base, go out and test the market. There's a critical piece here. You don't want to ask people, do they like your idea? Ask them if they would buy it. Ask them how much they would pay for it. And ask them to be really honest with you. Our friends and family have a terrible knack of being really nice to us, thinking that it's great. And what happens is you end up getting out into the business world and everybody's told you that everything's fantastic, but nobody actually wants to buy it because back at the start, you never ask these right questions. So if you've got the capacity to do some market research, define what's happening. This is by no means the be all and end all of market research, but it's clean, simple, practical, and can help you make a move further forward. So if you've got an existing database, the first thing you wanna do is chop up your database and see if you can see some kind of trends in there. Even simple, something as simple as open your accounting software, look back through the last 10, 20, 50 invoices that you've sent out, and just mentally think about the people that you've invoiced and what sort of trends are there? Are there similarities between age, sex, size, geographical location, type of business, type of industry that you're working in? You may have the same product that you sell to three different customer types. You may have three different products that fit three different customer types. So it's horses for courses molding this in your business. But the first piece of the puzzle that you really need to focus in on is who are they? What do they look like? Where do they hang out? What are their buying patterns? Why do they like you? Who, who are these people and why do they care about you? Why do you bring these people value? Because once you can decide this is who person number one is, 
you're gonna be able to provide value to that person even better. Now, if you are in the health profession, for example, you're gonna have the same service if you're a chiropractor or a physio or a podiatrist, you're gonna have more or less, not the exact same, but you're gonna have a similar service offering in three different customer types. If you're a videographer, you might have three different products that suit three different people. They're at different price points, they're at different tiers. There's, if you're a tradie, you might do uh, renovations, maintenance, new builds. There's three different things and you might then cross section that against some different customers as well. But building a little profile here of who your customers are is gonna pay dividends for you in a number of ways. The first way is that, and we'll talk about this in a second, but the first way is that you're gonna be able to have a better idea of how to promote to these people and get a better level of inquiry. And the second and third ways, when you actually get some inquiry, when your inquiries are coming in, you're gonna be able to qualify a lot better. One of the number one reasons that I see where businesses are struggling is because they spend so much time trying to fit a square peg in a round hole servicing a customer that isn't one of their primary types. The time that is spent trying to service somebody that isn't a great fit for you is often detrimental in so many ways and counterproductive even though you think you're trying to do the right thing. So if you have a clear idea of who you really do the best work with, then you can start to think about what is it about those people that really makes them your top customers? Is it because they've got a budget in mind? Is it because they've already experienced this, they're not brand new customers? If, for example, you're a digital agency. If you're a digital agency, you may prefer to bring on customers who have tried using a digital agency before and not had a great success because they know roughly what it's about but and they know roughly what went wrong and that's great. Conversely, you might be a digital agency that only likes to bring on people who have never used a digital agency before so you can create that value and that experience and hopefully get it right for them from the first time. So start to think about, first and foremost, what is it about these customers that makes them great customers for you? This is gonna be very unique and very different for every single business. What is it about your customer profiles that makes them great customers? And the last piece of this is, very simply, how do you talk about that? How do you find out, how do you ask the right questions? Where do you qualify these people in, so to speak? So to give you an example here, let's just say that I was an insurance broker. I'm a mortgage broker. So I know that my ideal customer is um, a double income, uh, no kids scenario. Both, both of the couple uh, are generating a substantial wage. That's fantastic. They live in a certain geographical region, all of those things. And they're the type of people who are motivated and have a timeline and want to take action. So how I could talk about that or how I would find out if they're the type of people to make action was after an initial meeting, I could leave a very small thing for them to do. Can they fill out this type of form for me? They, can they give me this type of information? And can they give it to me in a time frame that makes my life as the mortgage broker very simple? If they don't, then they're not really that type of customer. So starting to put things, not only questions that you ask, stuff that you talk about, but things into your process that can help you qualify your customers quicker so that you can spend less time working out whether or not you're gonna get the sale and more time delivering value to those who are great value to you. That's gonna be able to give you some massive impact in your business. There's wastage in all of these areas in every business that I see. So if you can take this and improve some of these things, you're gonna see this in time, dollars and frustration or lack of frustration, all gonna get better, all gonna improve and that's gonna free up time to be more productive. The third thing that I wanna talk about today is capacity. Capacity is a huge thing in your business and it's something that I see people get wrong all the time. People generally come to me with one of two problems. They're either down at this end of the scale where they've got no customers and their business is in danger of stalling 
or they're up here at this end and they've actually got more customers than what they can actually handle and their business is very stressful because uh, the systems and processes are not working and handling that volume of customers for the size of business that they have is very, very difficult. So capacity is really, really integral piece to your business and getting it right isn't entirely difficult. You can, you can do it in a few simple ways. So obviously the way that I look at it is a little bit like a car taco. If your business is ticking along down here and you're at 30%, you might be not covering your costs, you're in trouble, you're going backwards. If you're going up here, things are looking okay, things are looking okay. But then if I get around here, I'm at the maximum capacity that I can physically service. I'm seeing the most number of patients that I can see every week. I've got the most number of tradies on my books that I can handle. And if you don't have systems and processes in place here at this point, by the time you get to here, it's too late. It's really difficult. It's not impossible. It's really difficult though to put them in here because you've gone from here all the way around without them and the tendency is to fall back. In every business, there is a key metric or a couple of key metrics that will guide your capacity. If you're in a cleaning business, trades business, um, what else we got? Those uh, sometimes legal services, accounting, all of those type of, some of those professional services, it'll be billable hours. How many billable hours can you do with the staffing roster that you have and do those billable hours translate into the financial profits that you want? We talked back at the start about looking at what is the bottom line that you wanna generate in your business and how do you get that through products and hours and that kind of stuff? You've gotta have the staffing capacity to get that. This is a very unique thing for you. It's very different in every business. I've seen people who wanna operate as a one-man band and generate a smaller amount of money but have no staff and bigger profit margins because they've got no overheads. I've seen people who want and work with businesses who have an international products that they ship all over the country and they've got 50 or 60 staff trying to do it. They've got multiple locations. It's very personal for you. Quick, quick horror story that I heard. I recently did some work with a company in the cleaning services side of the world and they had grown to about 90 staff. They've grown all the way up to 90 staff thinking that this is great, this is what we gotta do, we just gotta get bigger, we gotta get bigger, that's what everybody does. Turns out, they don't need to be that big to make the money that they want. They actually, since gone through a pretty substantial downsize, they're back to about 20, 30 staff, they've got a lot less headaches, they're doing really well, and everybody's happy. So this is a very unique thing for you, and for your business, and for why you got into business, and what you wanna get out of it. So first and foremost is know the metric. What is the metric that you work on? Whether it's hours, clients, whatever it might be, know that metric and know your boundaries of when you're at a stall point, when you're at a danger point. The next thing that you wanna look at is if you are getting up to this kind of area where you're here and you're okay, well, we're at kind of 75, 80%, 90%, we're almost reaching our capacity. You've really got two primary options for how you can recreate more capacity. You can either trim out some of the clients that you don't like. You can be more selective with your client base. You can charge more for what you do, basically keeping the same amount of physical resources being building, production, hours, whatever that might be, but keeping the same amount of resources and trimming down the number of clients that you do for and increasing your profit margin, or maybe not even increasing your profit margin, but just maintaining a really select and specific group of clients that you look after. The other alternative is that you have to create more capacity. If you wanna create more capacity, there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can do that from technology, labor, infrastructure, whatever those things might be. If you wanna increase your capacity, there's a bunch of different ways that you can do it, but you have to know what is the metric that you're looking at, what is the most important thing, and what are you gonna do, what are you actually gonna do when you get to that point? because you might reach that point in six months. And if you do, and you just keep plowing through and keep growing and keep growing, in another six or 12 months, you're gonna look back and find out that you're just miserable and you've done something that wasn't the right thing for you. 
and now you're stuck with a monster. So know your metric, know what you're looking out for, know where those are, and this will segue back into your promotional activity. Some people are trying to run promotional activity to, that would suit a multi-million dollar business and generate so many more leads, but they've actually only got the capacity to take on three more clients every week. So this works in a couple of ways there. It'll help you first and foremost with, you, with, with this in terms of knowing what you're up to. It'll help you with your promotional activity and making sure that you're doing promotional activity in line with what your capacity is to do things. And secondly, it'll help you with your, the, what I call the pulse of your business. This is understanding the pulse of your business and what you're looking out for. Um, there'll be more specific topics coming on both of those, but know your metrics, know what you're looking at, know where your capacity is, and that's gonna give you a massive kickstart for your planning and making sure that you're on the right track at the right time, looking at these things on a daily, weekly, monthly basis as frequently as you need to. All right guys, stick with me. This is the fourth piece, we're almost there, but if you haven't already got a ton of value out of what you're gonna do, this one I know you're gonna get a lot of value. This has a tremendous impact in, the, in your business. This is called drawing your operational flow. Now, whether you find this hard, difficult, it's a really essential piece of your business. If you can't show this to somebody, it's really difficult to explain what's going on. In think of bringing on new staff, showing investors what's gonna happen, uh, getting teams to work well together. If you've got a problem in your business where the tradesmen don't talk to the office people or the admin staff don't talk to the practitioners or the sales people don't talk to the marketing people, all of those problems and all of those barriers, you can start to break them down by doing this. Being able to draw this as your operational flow of your business is super critical, shows the whole process of what's working, shows how people interact with each other, and gives people an understanding of, oh, that's my role, and that's how my role interacts with all of the other roles, and that's why it's important for me to do these little things. So, if we take a brief look at this, every business does these things. We promote and attract new clients. Then there's a conversion process, and sometimes that's happening in the same way. And then you've got to deliver, at some point, some form of value. This is a booking, a building, whatever it is that you're doing. And then one of the most important things is being able to retain your staff. In an administration capacity, you've got to manage that whole point. But as a business, your job is to convert customers from here, being either not aware of you or aware of you but not ready to purchase, you've got to take them from here all the way along here. Now, if you can draw this out and map this really clearly, what it allows you to do is from a back end, build systems, processes, proceed, uh, and, and set up the technology that you need to make your life easy on a day-to-day -day basis. It allows you to identify bottlenecks and see, oh, well actually we can do this really well and we do this really well, but if we do too much of this, uh, and we don't do this in line with our capacity here, then all of a sudden we're in trouble because you've got a bottleneck here at the delivery point, which means unhappy customers, which means you're gonna drop off at a retention side of things. Already I know just drawing this that people are gonna be looking at this and going, okay, well that's where they are, this is where the problems are. Being able to break this down in a little bit more detail is super critical for you. So even if you were to take a very brief example, say, okay, from a promotional point of view, you've got, um, you might do some networking, you've got a referral, you do some online stuff, you might have some Google ads. Um, whatever you might be having here, there's traditional, whether you're at a trade show, something like that. Whatever you've got happening here, that forms into some kind of inquiry. We talked before back at identifying your customer base. This is where that stuff comes into its own and you can say, okay, well, this is how we make sure that we got the most people getting from an inquiry into a paid booking customer. Sometimes, if you sell a high value product or a highly complex product, the complexity of this will deter people from actually making a decision. Generally speaking, as human beings, if we're faced with too many choices or too many options, the choice that we make is none. So what you wanna be able to do for your customers is to be able to break this down into step-by-step -step process and be able to walk them through the process. And this is where you build your customer journey from, but you walk them through the process in saying, well, you're here 
and the next thing that you need to do is this. You don't have to worry about every single choice that you're gonna make. The, the scenario that just came to my head is, imagine that you're renovating a house. You don't have to choose every single fitting right back here, but you have to agree on a budget for fittings or whatever you might do. So how do you help minimize the friction here and just make sure this whole process is going smooth? If you get into a delivery piece, there might be different departments. So this department does this per, and then splits off and there's two other things that need to happen and it ends up back here. You've got some suppliers that have to come in and eventually you put people here into your database. Well, they should already be in there, but now that they're going, now that they've had hopefully a great customer experience with you, what is happening with those people? How are you nurturing those? We're going to talk about that in a minute, but just want to really reiterate, this is not difficult. This is not impossible. Nobody's business is so complex that this can't be done. Yeah? I'm fortunate, I guess, in that I see the world in blocks and nodes like this. When people talk to me about their businesses, I instantly start thinking about, well, that piece interacts with this piece and this is how it fits here and that's how it fits there. It's not better, worse, smarter. It's just how I see it. The balance here will start to impact so many things in your business from you being able to identify very clearly where the problems are, get the teams engaged with each other and stop that silo thinking that, oh, this is my role and I don't give a shit about anybody else because I'm just doing my job. Well, your job here impacts the jobs here. Your jobs here impact the jobs back here. Everything in this is a cycle. They all interrelate, they're all interdependent on each other. And if you can show your staff this, then staff begin to understand. It's one thing to say, oh, you're in the sales department, the sales department and the marketing department really need to get along. It's different to be able to draw it and put it in front of them and say, this is what's going on, this is the problem. That very specific problem that we had yesterday in our business, this is where that happened. And start to create and break down those barriers so that everybody realizes that, hey, everyone's on the same page here, everyone's fighting for the same thing. So map that out, get your systems and processes built on the back end to support it, and then it also provides a fantastic opportunity for you to be able to look at your customer journey from a front end and think, well, as the customer goes through this, what are they feeling? How are they thinking? What are they experiencing at this point in time? And how can you make that better for them so that they process through that, through that whole experience from start to finish, better, more fun, and come out of it as a more happy and enthusiastic customer about your business. So if you haven't already spent some time on this, really encourage you to make sure that this is something that you spend a couple of hours on and get right in your business. You don't have to have it perfect. You can build over it on multiple iterations, but it's definitely a highly valuable tool for you to have in your business. So the fifth and final thing that I wanna talk about today is your customer database. What are you doing with it? How do you use it? What sort of value does it bring in your business? It is a super critical piece of your business. Customers, it costs on average, depending on, there's been multiple studies done on this, but it costs more than five to seven times the amount to acquire a brand new customer as it does to sell to a customer who has already been through your process to retain a customer and build one. So do you wanna spend time, money, effort getting new people in, or do you wanna spend time, money, effort making the most out of the people that you already have service, that already love you, love your brand? When can they come back? How do they come back? What sort of other things can you bring them value with? It's a genuine toss up for me between customer database and teams, like your staffing roster, as to which one business owners undervalue more and underutilize. Underutilize is probably the better word. People see value in them, but then don't actually use that. Both of those things, and what we're gonna talk about now is your customer database, both of those have a tremendous amount of value for you. So if we were to take a look at what are some of the key things that you can do with your customer database. So first and foremost, say thank you. Human nature dictates that every single one of us loves to be appreciated, loves to be shown thanks. 
how can you say thank you? How do you use this database to not just necessarily flick an email, but keep track of who spent how much money? Can you, as a, as a thank you, as a byproduct of this, could you run some events? Could you give away some tickets? Could you do a prize draw? All of these things are gonna help build that trust that you have with your customers. Now, depending on the business that you're in, if you build houses, for example, your uh, customers aren't gonna be coming back every six weeks to buy another house. You know? But this is still a principle that you can apply. Who are the people that you've built an entire house for? Who are the people that you've done a renovation for? Is there a, a spend threshold that you do? You know, if you've got a very small number of customers, the smaller your customer base, the more important it is for you to look after this. If you have a huge customer database, it's not necessarily less important, but you've just got to maintain it and look at it in a, in a really tricky way. If you sell $20 sunglasses online, you've got to sell a lot of $20 sunglasses. So then you become in the boat of, well, if they bought $20 sunglasses that were like this, and this is why they like us, maybe they'll buy a $15 watch or a $30 pair of earrings, or when is it seasonal? How are you getting access and what sort of offers are you putting out to your database? could be the difference between you having a really profitable year, you floundering versus potentially going out backwards. So make sure that you're looking after your customer database, how you manage it, you can do it in Excel. There is a whole bunch of software programs. from a, a CRM point of view. Jump on YouTube and YouTube best CRM, best customer management. The principle of how you manage it won't help if it's not a priority for you. It has to be a priority for you to really value and utilize your customer database and through that operational process, look at how can you just bring more value to them all the time? What is it that they want? How do you service those needs? and how do you continue to nurture that relationship that you have with them, that's gonna be the difference between those, the front end of your business and the orders keep on coming through and coming through and the back end of your business being actually really profitable. So last tip for the day, leverage your database and really use that. It takes so much effort to gain trust with people. Trust is harder and harder commodity to, to get now because of all of the competition that's in the world when literally every single product and every single, um, and the availability of access. So trust is incredibly difficult to gain. If you've created a great customer experience and you've built trust with people, leverage that trust. Don't just let them wander off into the wilderness and say, thanks, never see them again. So that's my last tip for you for today. Um, you can jump on, there'll be a link downstairs, down below, <laughs> downstairs. There'll be a link down below where you can uh, download a further tips. It's completely free, don't want any emails or anything like that, but they're my top five for you to get into. If you look at each of these things in your business, you're gonna have a great year ahead. And if each of these things improve 5% in your business, what would that really mean to you? The most important thing is that you take action with some of this stuff. Any one of those pieces is going to make a massive impact in your business and help you move forward. If you're doing multiple, then you're gonna move forward really, really fast, which is what we set out to do and what I set out to do trying to help businesses with Orb Services. So if you're the type of person who can take that, run with it and make some improvements in your business, go get amongst it. I'm absolutely stoked for you. I wanna see that happen. So if you're wondering how you're gonna make this happen in your business and apply this to your circumstances, give me a buzz. We can have a chat about it over a coffee or frothy and we can chat about how to make it work in your business.